Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> hey, uh, I just wanted to, be, before we dive into um, this series and this message, just wanted to just say thank you so much for all of your hard work uh, for the carnival. Uh, not only did we meet our volunteer goal, we met our financial goal about three days before, uh, which was awesome. Um, and again, continued to uh, make a huge statement and a very powerful example of the love of Christ in our community that sends ripples out far beyond, I think, anything we'll ever know. Um, one of the things that uh, I'll just have you know is we have a way, a metric um, of how we receive um, uh, connection is probably the cleanest way to put it from people in our community who attend the event. Uh, and this year's event was four times all every other year. Um, the highest year, just so you know, um, the highest year we've ever had was last year, um, and that was 87 people. This year was a little over 400. Um, so uh, people are desperate for a community, whether they recognize it or not. Um, and I'm just so glad that we are part of a community that makes that possible in our community. So thank you, church. Um, it was awesome. It was a, a great thing to be a part of. All right, <clears throat> so uh, I, I wanna pray and then I wanna dive right in because we've got a lot to get through and uh, only so much time. I say only so much time as if it changes. Every week it doesn't. It's been the same for a decade. I just always want more. Um, so <laughs> let us pray and then uh, if you'd like to join me, we're gonna start right out the gate in James chapter one. Uh, God, we thank you for this morning and for all that you did uh, in and through the carnival. God, I pray that ultimately uh, we would fix our eyes on you in whatever season of life that we find ourselves in. Jesus, we love you. We give this morning to you. It's in, in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so if you're here with us uh, or watching online, whichever is most convenient for you, you can open up your physical Bible. If you don't have one and you're here, uh, you can grab one and either exit. If you don't own one, take it. It's our gift to you. Or open up on the app, or it'll be up on the screens here. Uh, but I want to jump right into James chapter 1, and we're going to find out real quick what we're talking about this morning. James uh, who, if you don't know, James is the uh, half-brother of Jesus and was raised alongside Jesus for many years, not believing that his brother was God until post-death, burial, and resurrection, very much believed that his brother was God, so much so that he spent the rest of his days trying to tell other people that his brother was God, and it ultimately led to his death. And in that process of sharing and proclaiming in the pain that he endures, James goes through quite a bit. And so he speaks from a very personal place about what it means to push through things before you give up. So let's see what James, the brother of Jesus, has to say in James chapter 1, verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Ain't that great? So we see, now here, here is what James starts off with, which is a little disconcerting. He says, consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when, when ever, not if, not maybe, not on the off chance that you're so unfortunate that, no, it's when. James is going to start off this letter and he is going to maintain for the entire letter that you will experience pain. You're going to. And the concept or idea that you could somehow out earn it, uh, out educate yourself around it, that you could move to a different place and, and thereby avoid it, that you could go to a different country or whatever president is sitting in the seat would make it more or less is just asinine. It is inevitable. You are going to experience pain. And no matter how rich or poor, healthy or not, married, not married, where you live, kids, it doesn't matter. You are not exempt from pain as much as we would like to be. It is coming for you. And the Bible is unanimous in its approach. Different writers say it differently. 
uh, Peter says, don't be surprised. Like no follower of Jesus should ever say, what is this craziness happening to me? Don't be surprised. Peter, or I'm sorry, Paul uh, goes a little bit further. He says, don't be surprised and don't give up. Be resilient through it. And then James says both of those things. Don't be surprised, be resilient. But then James add this, adds this little obnoxious end. Um, and it's, it's joy. It's rejoice. It's um, be, be stoked. So here's, here's what James would say. Consider. Now, the, the word consider, um, we, okay, little disclaimer. I was talking this through with Pastor Fozzi, and um, we realized that, so I'm going to go through only, I think, 11 or 12 verses this morning in James. Y- you could do a week on each of these. There is so much in here, so I'm going to try to move quickly, but there is some very cool language stuff, because I geek out on all that, and I hope, I hope you can join me in the geekiness, because is, this is fantastic. Okay, so this word consider is hegiomai, and it consider is, is kind of It's not really a great translation because consider, you think consider is purely intellectual, right? Just kind of sit back and be like, huh, this sucks, right? Like that, that is considering the pain that you're in. That is not the fullness, but but if translators were to use the fullness of every concept, the Bible would be five times longer than it is. So they just use the word consider. The word literally translated means abide within, meaning set up space in the midst of. So when you're in pain, don't just think about it, set up camp in it. Be, be like in it, in it. And here's the thing, that word in Greek is a command. It is something that you are commanded to do. Why? Because if you are told not to, you will do literally anything else. And that's naturally what we do, right? We see pain in our life and our, our knee-jerk reaction is to avoid, is to go somewhere else, is to kind of skirt around and try to get away from it. But count, and I think this is also still the wrong translation from what I have. So we will we'll work it out because I got a lot of fun words that aren't exactly there. All right, count it joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. When you meet various, not one, not multiple, meeting, meeting trials, the word there is to unknowingly stumble inside and be surrounded by. So when you are abiding within a trial that you have fallen into and surrounded by, make sure that it is many kinds. The word there directly translated is multicolored or multifaceted. So when you experience the sucks of life and they are multicolored and they are widely varied, then just fall in it with great intensity and sit among it. That's what it's telling you to do. Stoked, aren't you, for this rest of this series? James is saying, no, don't just ignore it. Don't move aside from it. Sit down in it, camp in it, fall into it, be surrounded by it, and appreciate the vastness of its beauty. So the the, the idea would be, and and, and by the way, the, the, the multifaceted and multicolored, the way that the tense is, is it's intended to be stacked upon itself. So like, you lose your job and you're driving home and on your way home, your car breaks down. And then when you finally get home from your car breaking down, you say, the, the only thing I need is just like something to eat. And you go in and you realize that your refrigerator died because the breaker broke and you open up your fridge and realize that everything inside of it is now old and you need to throw it away. And then as you're doing that, your wife hands you divorce papers and your phone dings like, oh, your favorite player just got traded. (laughs) And when you're sitting there, you're like, awesome. (laughs) Not not that you would necessarily do that, but that's the idea that James wants to convey. 
Now, we have a, a kind of a, a vernacular phrase for this in our culture. When it rains, it pours, okay? He would say, when it rains, it pours, so grab an umbrella and enjoy the view, is what he would say. Now, this whole idea of setting up camp and rejoicing, I, I understand, I'll, I'll just say out loud what you're thinking. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Okay, I don't, I don't have to know you. I don't have to know your spiritual background. It makes sense, right? That that would be our like, come on, pastor, you can't be real. That, that is the dumbest thing. Because there are only two types of people that actually get excited when crazy stuff befalls them. The first type of person is a person who uh, is, we'll say, detached from reality, okay? Someone that is crazy, whether it be that there's something, uh, a mental health issue going on or a drug-induced issue or something where they are so detached from reality that you look at them and go, you should be screaming or crying or upset and you're happy. You are unwell. That's one type of person that would rejoice in the midst of pain and suffering. The other type of person is someone who knows something. Someone who knows that there is a deeper truth there, that there is something that can be produced within you. So, what are we called to be? Nut jobs <laughs> or people who know something? The um, Warren Wiersbe, um, in one of his commentaries on this, he said, and I thought this was great. He said, your value, your values determine your valuation. Values determine valuation. Meaning, how you see the world and what is happening to you, your interpretation of those things is completely based on the values that you hold. So if you value comfort over character, then things that are terrible and pain that befalls you will be unbearable and you will be crushed under the weight if comfort is the most important thing to you. If character is the most important thing to you, there might be a path through. Uh, if you value the material over the spiritual, when something threatens that material, you get all stressed and worked up and freaked out and you may lash out in anger. It's, it's all about what you value. And so James is, is going to begin to poke at the things that we value and the things that we hold true. So here he continues in verse 3. For you, now he's speaking to believers, for you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. For you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance or steadfastness or endurance. They have a, a bunch of different words to translate that. Now, you know this as well as I do. Difficult things in your life have potential for a positive result. We actually say that quick to people like, well, you know, God's gonna work all things together for good, which is the last thing that you wanna hear when you're in the midst of pain. It's not helpful. Christians are very, very good at being unhelpful in painful situations. I don't know if you've noticed this. I don't know if you've ever met a Christian um, in the midst of a difficult time, um, but we like to say things that are either A, out of context, or B, timed not well. This is one of those things. Because we, we know this. We've, we've been through painful things that on the other side of it, you're like, well, either A, that wasn't that bad, or B, you know, that actually ended up helping me out. Or like, we, we know that. We've seen enough of this world and enough of life to know that when pain hits, it's not all bad always. But how do we know what is actually being produced? What are the values that we're looking for? Well, James wants to give us three. James is going to give us three things that God wants to produce in us in the midst of our pain. The first is right there, perseverance. Perseverance. The unfortunate reality is that pain is an instrument used by God. He uses it well. We all know this to be true. How do we know this to be true? Because we can see this in our kids, okay? Teachers are getting ready to do this. Parents, 
you do this. Those of you who are teachers, God bless you, praying for you as you get ready to go back. Um, but I, I remember, and I, I don't remember which age it was exactly, but I remember the first time that we were trying to teach uh, my oldest, like just basic math, right? And so you got two plus two, he's like, four. I'm like, okay, well, calm down there, champ. There's a lot more math to go. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, and, and, and if you've ever taught a young child anything like this, there's the things that it's like, oh, this is so hard. I can't, well, you put it on your fingers and like, oh my gosh. And then they figure it out. And then you do something crazy, like introduce two to 13. Or even harder, 11 plus seven. And what do they do? I can't do that. That's impossible. I can't, what, how do you, I don't have 11 fingers. And you're like, I know, you have to use a different tactic. Now imagine if when your kid said, I can't do that. You go, you're right. This is far beyond your skill. We're done then. And I just hope for the remainder of your life, things are kept to single digit addition. <laughs> and you just said, I, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna push you through hard things and pain. We'll just, we'll stop here, but we found the limit of your abilities. Thank you so much for trying when you're four, right? But no, we push them. And we say, no, you have to do this. You have to continue. We, we have to learn how to add 11 plus seven. It's impossible, I know, but we can get there, right? And you push them through. One of the things that is, uh, you know, different parents have different core values. If you're a parent and you've never taken time to like think through your core values, you should probably do that because they are the guiding light by which you parent. Um, and you all have them just so you know whether or not you've identified it. Um, but one of my personal core values is to try to do everything I can. And my kids would know because uh, I say this to them often, is to do everything they can to be comfortable being uncomfortable. That is, that is just a personal thing of mine. I, because this world, I don't know if you know this, is very uncomfortable. And there are things in this world that are going to be uncomfortable. And if your natural response to uncomfortable things is just to tap out, you're gonna have a rough go. And so, you know, with wisdom, of course, and safety, I, I intentionally put them into uncomfortable situations. Situations where they do not like it, where they are not happy, where they uh, want to tap out and I just step back and let them struggle and let them work through it. One of the things was a number of years ago, uh, my middle son, Shane, um, I, I went hunting with him and uh, you know, I said, hey man, let, make sure you pack the right clothes. <clears throat> Some of you already see where this is going. Um, and uh, he's like, dad, I got it. And I said, are you sure? Do you want me to double check? He's like, dad, I said, I got it. I said, great. So there we were in a frigid, I don't know, like 43 degrees. And he is freezing his butt off. He's like, dad, I wanna go home. I said, well, that's not an option. Why not? Well, we gotta got work through. And we've worked that through multiple times um, where my kids are cold usually and hungry. Those are the, the, the top two things. Uh, and it's like, well, then either you will be uh, better prepared in the future or you're going to learn to adapt. Well, um, a couple weeks ago, we were in Alaska. We were in the middle of Glacier Bay National Park, and um, you will see all of us and then Shane. <laughs> um, so there's, there is uh, me on the far side, and there is my sister, and there is Shane. Um, yeah, just in uh, shorts and no shirt, just hanging out because over time, He's realized that, like, no, you just got to deal with hard things and adapt. We do this all the time. And this happens in your faith as well. You, you remember the first time you ever got challenged with your faith? I remember the first time I really seriously got challenged with my faith. It was in college. I showed up at college and I started talking uh, to a professor about my faith. And he poked, and because if you want to, you can poke some pretty easy holes. And he goes, well, what about Jonah? And I said, what about Jonah? He said, Jonah, Jonah wasn't real. And I said, what are you talking about? Jonah was real. And he said, well, let me show you this evidence. And he showed me a couple articles and things. And I was like, I maybe, I don't know if Jesus is real anymore. I think my faith is a whole sham, the whole thing. It's a sham, it's over, right? Just because someone challenged my faith and said, have you ever considered this? And me, 18 year old me was like, no, I'd never considered that. They're like, well, then maybe you haven't considered anything in your life. And I'm like, maybe I haven't, I'm sorry. Maybe I haven't, <laughs> right? So, I, and I don't know about you, but the first time someone pushed back on your faith, or pushed back in your life. Did you crumble? Maybe, but 
more likely than not, you persevered through. And what did you learn on the other side? I'm actually quite a bit stronger than I thought. And now you get to the point where, and I've, I've spoken to many followers of Jesus about this, and especially in the last couple of weeks, um, who are going through tremendous pain and horribly difficult things. And one of the things that I've continued to hear is they said, we've been through this before. God has gotten us through. And I don't see why he wouldn't get us through again. Now you can only say that if you didn't tap out the last time. But some of you, your faith is just the tap out game. You get to a certain point and you go, I'm out, I'm out, I can't do it. And then your response to pain is, I don't know, God just never brings me through. No, I think you don't bring yourself through. God is there walking alongside and waiting for you on the other. Like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You know, like, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. But if you've been through difficult things, you get to the point where over a number of years, there's a, I've, I've been through this. I've walked by people who've been through this. I've seen people go through this. And if you're early on or young in your faith, like that just, you're like, how in the world? Trust me. And there's people in this room who would absolutely agree. Yes, it is possible to not tap out in the midst of pain. And I get it. I, I understand the, the kind of logical pushback, which is, okay, so you're saying that James would suggest be built up so that I can get punched in the face, so that I can be built up, so that I can get punched in the face, so that I could take a bigger punch? Come on, this, this, the logic breaks down at some point. And, and I, I, I get that. The idea or question of there has to be something more than that. Yes, there is. And James knows that. And so he says it in verse four. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And let. I just want to pause on that word for just a second. There is a reason why he says let. Because the implication is there that you may not let it work. There is an opportunity to have pain come and not let it work for your good and not build you up and not make you stronger. This is something you have to let it happen. You have to let God work in and through you. And it all hinges on one thing. And that is how you answer this question. Do you believe God is good? That is the question. Because if you believe God is good, then what he says about moving through hard things and I will never leave you or forsake you and I have your best interest at heart and your best days are ahead are actually a promise from a good father. But if you don't believe he's good, or if you question, we'll talk about that in a second with something James says that is uh, initially very infuriating, but makes a whole lot of sense. It would cause you to be bitter rather than better, as Warren Wiersbe would say. So in verse four, he gives our second thing. Our first is perseverance. Our second is perfection. Perfection. Let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, that you may be perfect. Now, the translation that is up here says another word that is a great translation of that, and that is the word mature. I don't know if you've recognized this yet, but difficulty has a unique way of revealing your deficiency, doesn't it? When you come up against difficult things, you realize how much you don't have in the tank or the skills that you just don't really have. But actually pushing through and getting to a place of more maturity, I don't even have to know you to know that that happened to your hero. Whoever you make as your hero, whether it be like Spider-Man or someone in history, an actual physical human being, they actually went through this process. No one is exalted to hero who came up to pain and was like, I'm out. We don't write books about them. 
We don't make movies about them. Every single person that you hold in high regard came up to pain, evaluated, and pushed through. The word there is telesos, which means a fullness, a maturity, a completeness. And the thing that James is actually going to argue for is faith is really only faith when it goes through hard stuff. It's easy to have faith when life is going well. And James would borderline argue that that isn't faith. Faith that, that, that doesn't cost you anything and faith that isn't put to the test in any way is really no faith at all, is what James would say. But there is a completeness, a perfection, a fullness, a maturity that is needed. The best way I can explain it is a baseball metaphor. <clears throat> Shocker, I know. Um, so I, I remember when um, Carter, my youngest, was, was, was very young. Um, and uh, growing up, one of the things I loved to do, I loved to pitch. That was my, I couldn't hit for anything, but I could pitch. And so I, I, I would teach him how to pitch. And if you've ever, if you know baseball, if you ever taught a kid how to pitch or your kid has ever learned how to pitch, there's, there's really just one pitch they learn right out the gate. And that's just a fastball two seam, four seam, whatever, usually four, and it's just fastball. And the goal is don't hit the batter, you know, um, get it in the range of the catcher, right? Like it's pretty basic. Uh, throw strikes, which is a, a bit beyond most like six and seven year olds, right? But just, just fastball. Now there comes a time in a pitcher's life, right around when they're eight, nine, 10, when just throw fastballs down the middle doesn't work anymore. Because if you tell a 10 year old, hey, Fastball's down the middle. That's all you got. Throw it hard. What do you think is going to happen to a few of those fastballs down the middle? They're going to get jacked for home runs because that's all you got. And the batters get smart enough to figure out that's all he has. I'm just going to sit fastball in the middle and wham! And, they just, and they'll just tee off on the kid. So at some point, two things need to happen simultaneously. Their fastball needs to get better, meaning add a little bit of movement and they need to add something else. They need to add something off speed. They need to add a change it because they're not complete. They're not perfect. They're not full. They're not mature. They need to continue to grow what they have and add what they don't. So then you can actually add something an off speed pitch that when they get quick on the fastball, they go, whoa, what was that? Oh, he's got different pitches. I need to pay attention more. I've got to change my approach and their batting average will go down. Well, then you get up to 13, 14, 15. And if they know, well, all it is is fastball change up, then I'll just sit on the change up and I'll just wait for them to throw something soft and I'll hit it over left center. So then you need to add something else. You need to add a slider or a change, right? So you, just, you, you continue to grow what is and you keep adding what isn't. You will never see a major league pitcher that just throws fastballs down the middle because they don't get anywhere. They would be called an incomplete ball player. But if you see someone, like thank God we've finally begun to see with the Giants, <laughs> there is a reason why when a pitcher makes it through the game, they call it a complete game. And he is a complete pitcher or a perfect game. It'd be weird to call it a mature pitcher or a mature game. That would be weird. But that's the, that's the word James would use. He would say, you are complete. And that is God's goal. One of his goals in pain is to take what is already in you and strengthen it and then add what you don't have. Because if you think you're going through the pain and the struggle that you have right now and you are the full and complete package, <laughs> um... God will show you that you are not. We'll put it that way. God has a way of helping and also humbling. So. But his goal is never to hurt. His goal is never to hurt. The goal is to use what is there and add. Verse 5, he continues. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. The last thing, the third thing, there is perseverance, there is perfection, and then there is wisdom. There is wisdom. I don't know if you've ever gotten to the point in your life 
where you're in the midst of something. And by the way, I've said this for a while, and I'll, I, I, I meant to say it earlier, so I'll say it now. Um, everyone in this room, I don't have to know your story, but there's something that I know is true about you. We are all either in the midst of a painful situation, heading out of a painful situation, or preparing to go in to a painful situation. You are somewhere on that, on that sequence. There is no one in this room that is absent of and will stay absent of pain. If you are, let me know. I've never met anyone. You are either in the midst, coming out of, or getting ready to head in. So if you're thinking like, man, life's been pretty good right now. <laughs> that's you. You're getting ready to go in. And if you're sitting in the midst of it, you already know. I don't even have to tell you. You already know. But have you ever been in, in, in a situation, maybe you're here now, maybe you're like, this was last night, um, where you are in the midst of pain and you yell out to God, God, I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to do any of this. And God's loving, caring response is, I know. Let me show you. I know. Humility is the key to clarity. If you think you can do it all, then what do you need God for? And that's honestly, for most people in the West, in the Americas, that is their general response to God. I got it. He didn't make that paycheck. He didn't buy that house. He didn't make this marriage work. He didn't raise that kid. I did. I look, look at everything I've done. Right up until it doesn't work anymore. And then you come up against something, you're like, I don't know what to do with that. And just so you know, God is a big boy. He can handle, handle your anger and frustration. But then on the other side of that, God will never shame you for not knowing what to do. Nowhere in the word of God does someone cry out to God, God, what, what am I supposed to do with this? And he goes, seriously? Come on, man. It's pretty obvious, no? I, I mean, everyone knows. I don't, how do you not know? He never does, he's never going to shame you for admitting your weakness. But if you can't acknowledge the sincerity in the search of that, God, I don't know what's going on. God, I don't know what I'm doing here. God, I need help. None of this makes any sense. I just look in every area of my life. My financial life is a mess. My relationships are a mess. My career is a mess. My health is a mess. God, everything is a mess. Why is this happening? And then James goes into a response that if you read it just quickly, it, it's really frustrating. So let me just, just give me a sec to explain it, okay? So, so this is James' suggestion to what happens when you need some help and support and you realize that you are not enough. Verse six, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. You can't doubt. Now that's the part that people go, what? Hold on, just one sec. I'll explain. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is, double mind, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Okay. So if, if you just read James quickly, you, you can have this idea of ask God for wisdom but when you do, you better not doubt. Because if you are a doubter, then you should not respect, expect to receive anything. And you're like, seriously? I, the, if I'm honest, the reason I'm asking is because I'm also kind of doubting. So is this saying then that if I have any level of doubt that God's like not going to hear my prayer? No. He, he's not saying that you won't struggle. And he's not saying that, that you can't doubt. What he's saying is don't be two-sided. Don't be double-minded. Let, let me put it like this. There are some of us, let's just be honest. We will trust God and do exactly what he says until it doesn't work. Or another way to say it. There are many of you who have started a diet and you are all whole 30 on Monday, 
all about it. But Tuesday is Taco Tuesday. And I don't know if you've ever had Taco Tuesday. Wednesday, I don't know what Wednesday is, so I'll go back on the diet. But Thursday is margaritas, right? So, so what he's saying is, don't be the person who is committed one day and not the next. Pick one. Either God is going to see you through this pain or he's not. But this whole idea of, I wake up one day and I trust God. I wake up one day and I doubt God. I wake up one day and I trust God. And I wake up and I doubt God. And you go back and forth. What's going to happen is, like he says, you are going to be like a ship tossed by the waves and you will feel unstable. And that is not because God changed, but because you changed your perspective of God. Either he is God and will see you through or not. But stop changing your mind every day. One of the things that James hates is duplicity. That you say one thing and do the next. It drives him insane. Because he would say, this is my brother. And I trust my brother. And you can trust him too. And so what is wisdom? What is wisdom all I'll end with this. When, when God gives us wisdom, he gives us one of two things. Or sometimes both, if you're really in for fun. Um, it is the wisdom to loosen your grip and lift your gaze. Loosen your grip and lift your gaze. Here it is in verse 9. We'll look at the first one. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, in the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Now, this is kind of a, a weird thing, you would think, um, of why James starts talking about scorched earth and money. Well, because it goes to the first bit of wisdom to loosen your grip. Loosen your your grip. We can go to that next one. Yeah. Here's why. When you go through pain, it is the natural human response to grab onto something. And usually, the thing you grab onto is the thing you have exalted the most. Why does he talk about money? Because when we go through tough stuff, many times, we will look at our bank account to see if everything's good. And if we can grab onto something, go, okay, okay. Here, here's what I've learned. Pain will expose where you have given temporal stuff the weight of your eternity. Let me say that again, because that is really important. When pain comes into your life, it will expose where you have tried to place on the shoulders of just stuff the weight of eternity and it can't handle it your bank account cannot handle the weight of your eternity james would even be so bold as to say ladies beauty cannot handle the weight of your eternity so when you get so caught up in the way that you look it can, you can't handle it and what james would say the reason why he's he's he actually references beauty. He references beauty and riches because he, even 2,000 years ago, recognizes that for most, when men come onto something difficult, they will grab onto their careers. And they will grab onto their identity that way. And women will grab onto how they look. Men, if you lost your job tomorrow, would you be discouraged? Or would you be devastated because you, you've always done this and I, 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 I don't know what else I would do. I don't, I don't even know who I am anymore. Ladies, if you lost your hair tomorrow, would you be disappointed? Or would you be devastated? Because I, I, don't, know how, I don't know how I could go on. And that's what James is trying to hold up. It's okay to be discouraged. But when you are devastated, of, I, I can't go on then you've given that your soul. And you've given it the weight of your eternity. So loosen your grip. Pain will help you realize that the things of this world are just that, the things of this world. 
and there is not enough money and cars in your driveway and careers and friends that can save you from pain. And then he wants to give us a second bit of wisdom that happens in verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. He wants us to loosen our grip and lift our gaze and give us an eternal perspective. I know it's, it's difficult in the midst of pain to recognize that there is more than just this life, that we are living not just for now, but for eternity. And people, in, an, another unhelpful thing that Christians will often say is, everything happens for a reason. Sure. Yeah, I guess. But you know what no one ever follows up that question with? Whose reason? Who, what reason? What? Everything happens for a reason. Whose? My, my boss? Satan? My, my cousin? Me? You? Whose reason? What? Because someone, the, the implication in that phrase is there is someone or something that controls reason and it is for their benefit. So who? Who is benefiting from this? And I know that for many in our culture, there is just this whole idea of like, and I've had this conversation, two weeks ago I had this conversation with a friend of mine. He said, you know, I, I think I'm coming to the point where I've just realized that pain just exists for pain and nothing really comes of it and then we just die. I was like, that's kind of depressing. He goes, not if you just accept it. I said, yeah, I guess. But I don't know about you. I don't want to live a life that is just pain, 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 dead. I, I don't, I just, I refuse to accept that. Primarily because there was a God who sent his son who rose from the grave who says that's not true. He says, no, there's, there's actually something more. And you can go through pain with an anchored faith and actually truly come out on the other side with more strength and resolve, perseverance, more maturity, gained wisdom, if you anchor your faith in me. Whose reason? God's. For his glory and your good. This week, um, there has been, you know, in a church uh, our, our size, there's kind of seasons and things ebb and flow, but the, the ebb and flow recently has been a lot of pain and loss. Um, I've, I've talked to a number of folks and her, it's just, it's just the season that we're in. Uh, as a community, there's just been a lot. But one of the things that I've been so encouraged and strengthened and given my own personal uh, edification and resolve from is talking to so many of you who see faith carry you through. I have not spoken with a lot of people who are dismayed and discouraged and can't go on. I've spoken with people who are discouraged but not dismayed. And there is a difference. I'm sure you've experienced it before. There is a discouragement that takes you out and then there's a discouragement that sits for a season and then gets you through. Why? Because you didn't give up. You didn't tap out on your faith. You allowed God to do something in and through you to show you who he is in the midst of your pain so that you could get to the other side. Some of you, that is your story. The reason that God worked through you, the way that God called you to, the reason that you're even sitting in this room is because of pain. Because something happened and you said, God, I need something more than this life. And he said, yeah, come on. It's called my son. Let me introduce you. God can work incredibly through pain. If, as James says in verse three, if you let him, if you let him. We're gonna continue to build on this idea over the next few weeks, but I would encourage you to, if you're in the midst, to be honest and ask God for help and see how he's giving you perseverance to see how he is completing and maturing you and the wisdom that can be gained through it. Amen?
Let us pray and sing some songs of worship in response. God, we thank you so much for your your presence with us through pain. God, I pray for those who are going through some of the most unimaginable, painful seasons in their life right now. God, that you would be their strength as they persevere through, that you would be their guiding light as you bring them to maturity and completion, and that you would speak clearly as you give wisdom. Jesus, we trust you. We love you. It's in your name we pray.